take your Bible and go with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 10 and finish the letter today. For several months now, we've been working through this letter, seeing piece by piece as Paul has instructed these believers at Philippi. He's closing the letter today. The section we looked at last week, verses 1 through 9, is the the close of the exhortation. It's the the final explicit instructions as he's sort of drawing a lot of the themes to a close. But in this final section, I want you to see that though the explicit commands are not the same as they were earlier in the letter, Paul is still instructing us that he's he's writing to close out this letter, to give final greetings, but to really give a word of, of thanks, of appreciation to them and to the Lord for their partnership together in the gospel. And even in this word of gratitude, this, this word of thanks, Paul is instructing us. He's just demonstrating for us what it looks like for us to be in partnership together in the gospel. It's a, a standard closing that we see similar versions of in other uh, than Paul's New Testament letters, that he's writing to think them. They have financially supported him. Remember, they sent a gift with Epaphroditus with him that, that he might come to minister to him while Paul was in prison, and Paul is sending him back to them with this letter. And so Paul closes the letter with this final word of, of greeting and thanks. Read with me beginning in verse 10 of chapter 4. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Partnerships are fragile, delicate things. That Being together and partnering with other people in a way that is sustainable is really difficult. Yet everything significant we're doing in life is really hard to do alone. We, partnerships are incredibly important, but they're, they're fragile. They're, they're tough things to balance. If you just think even in the world around us, so many partnerships, so many teams have, have broken up. You just even think in the music realm, how many great bands have failed to hold together? Right? The Eagles broke up. Sonny and Cher broke up. The Beatles, for you millennials, that's like when One Direction broke up. Right? The, these great acts that were partnered together, they, they couldn't stay together. They couldn't have the shared vision and goal. Apple, early Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, some of the two early founders of, Apple's couldn't, of Apple, couldn't work together. They, they broke up. The second greatest basketball player to ever live, Michael Jordan, and his running mate, Scottie Pippen, apparently are no longer on speaking terms. That they, they won six championships together and, and now refuse to speak to one another. John Calipari in Final Force. These things that used to go together <laughs> we find a way to be separated. That partnerships are a delicate balance. They are fragile. They're hard to hold together. It's hard to keep people together on the same team. If you are a believer... If you've been a believer for any amount of time at all, if you've been to any sort of church ever on this planet, you have probably found that the church is not immune to this. And if you have walked with Jesus and been involved in church life much at all, you probably have some story somewhere in your past about a, a bad church split, which the church split over the color of the carpet or which snacks to buy for the children's ministry in which they were always fighting and division, and what started well often ended poorly with hurt, with division. 
That even in the body, partnership is a fragile thing. That even in the body, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, remaining connected, remaining on the same team is difficult. That's why we need to hear Paul's instructions from this, this final passage. That Paul in his ministry is well aware that partnership is a fragile thing. He is well aware that it is difficult for us to remain united and together sharing the same goal. It has been a theme throughout the entire letter. Paul has been calling us to be united. If you go back, what is the, the main theme, the main passage for all of the whole letter? What is the main goal that we would, chapter 1, verse 27, live as citizens worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I would argue that as Paul has laid that out throughout the entire letter, he's been telling us that we're to live as citizens worthy of the gospel together. That we're not only to have this mind that was in Christ, but we're to think the same things. We're to strive side by side. We're to stand together in peace that he has been calling us. Again, it is the consistent call throughout all of the entire letter. If you go back all the way to the first uh, passage we, we preached three months ago, that the banner over the church at Philippi, the banner over every church of the Lord Jesus ought to be the glory of Christ supreme in all things. The gospel at the center working together, Paul has been calling them together that they might strive together for the sake of the gospel, that living as a citizen worthy of the gospel requires that we partner together in the gospel. You cannot live as a citizen worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Paul says this is a community project, that you're to do this together in the body, that life in Christ it's done only with other believers. It is a group project. We do this together. If you notice the word that Paul uses again here in this passage, uh, look in verse 15. He, he speaks of this partnership that he has with the Philippians. He says, when I left Macedonia, which is their region, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. That Paul describes their relationship as a partnership. It's, it's the same word he's used way back in chapter 1. Much of what we see in this passage is a mirror of passage uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. That just as he began the letter, now Paul is closing the letter with the same things. If you go, you go back to chapter 1, verse uh, 1 through 11, you are reminded that Paul's main prayer there in verse 3 is that he says, I thank my God for you. Why? For your partnership in the gospel. And so now as he comes to a close, he, he says, I, I'm rejoicing over this partnership that we have. We've entered into this partnership. You remember the word there is koinonia. It's, it's fellowship, that they have a fellowship together in the gospel. That fellowship is much more than spending time uh, with believers. That when we hang out with unbelievers, it's fun. When we hang out with Christians, it's fellowship. That's what we say. And yet Paul says that this word is about much more than relationship. It is about shared value. It's about a shared goal. It's shared and mutual responsibility and vision. That if you remember, it was uh, we talked about this in chapter one. It's a business term. That two men that if they began a fishing business and they were going to split that business 50-50, they, the, the legal contracts would say, say that they had a fellowship in that business. They they were partners in that business. This is the image Paul is using. We are partners together in the gospel. We have a shared stake in the gospel, a shared vision, a shared goal the glory of Christ to be lifted up, to live as citizens worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That citizenship requires partnership. It requires this level of koinonia, of, of fellowship. I want you to see, even as we walk through this passage today, that what we have in this body, in the local body of the Lord Jesus Christ, Bakran, which is a representation of the body of Christ in this particular place, what we have here in this body is partnership. That we partner together at the local level in this body for the sake of the gospel, that we are partners. We, we share a fellowship in the gospel. We have a shared vision. We're working together. Many members, different gifts, different experiences, different ways and roles that the Lord uses us, but there is one body working all together. We are in partnership, not just with each other, but we are in partnership with those who are outside of this body for the sake of the gospel, those that have been sent out of the body to go to dark places to reach the lost. So you'll notice that when we, we speak about our partners, we're careful to use that language of partner. When we talk about missionaries or church planners or those that we are in agreement with, that we're not talking about employees. We're not talking about people that we merely support. We, we call them missionary partners. So you hear us talk often about Kenny and Cheryl Morris, who are IMB missionaries in Panama. We, we supply them with money and food and resources and all sorts of things, but they, we're not their employers. We're not their suppliers. They are our partners in the gospel. They are missionary partners. Zach and Jen Thurman and the team uh, that left this body to plant uh, the, the church in, in Fort Collins, Overland Church. 
They are our partners in the gospel. Even now, as Zach and Jen have sent out Buddy and Brooke and their team from Fort Collins to Durango, Colorado, some eight hours away, they are our partners in the gospel. We're partnering with them for the sake of the gospel. You hear us talk about our Romanian partners. Our two main ones are Daniel Barra and Emmaus Church, in, in really now Connected Life Church in Birmingham, England. They are partners in the gospel. Yosef Marika, who was with us in the fall, who Hannah and I will go to, to visit and to share with them this summer in Yash, Romania. They are our partners in the gospel. That this is what Paul is talking about. The local body partnering together, serving together as one body, partnered fellowship together in the gospel, and then partnering with others who are out of the body who've been sent out. That's the model here that Paul says, that he has been sent out of the body. He's traveling, he's planting churches, he's preaching the gospel, he's going into unreached places, and the local body is not just partnered together, but they've partnered with him, that they're in fellowship of the gospel, that to be a citizen requires that we enter into partnership. And notice the way Paul describes it, that this partnership involves both giving and receiving. He says, when I left your area, no one entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. That this partnership is not one partner who does all the giving and one partner who does all the receiving. That a true partnership, a true fellowship in the gospel is both giving and receiving from both sides. That we, we partner together for the sake of the gospel. That there is giving of time and energy, of resources, including money. There is a, a giving of ourselves, a pouring out of ourselves for the sake of the gospel. We, we give of our time, our money, our bodies. We pour it ourselves in the body. We do that at a local level. We do that in this body. It's part of what partnership is. It means that you serve the body. You give. So you serve in kids ministry or on welcome team or in the parking lot or you serve and serve Frankfurt. Or you serve in student ministry. Or you teach a class or you pray or you disciple. You serve in a way. You pour out yourself. You give in the body. There is in gospel partnership a giving, but there's also a receiving. Then not only do we give at the local level, we, we give, but we also receive. We receive time and energy and resources and money and seek to steward those things well. That we receive from the service of others. So not only do you serve and you give, but you, you receive ministry from the other members of the body. That they serve you. They serve you in kids' ministry or in student ministry. They pray for you. They teach you. They disciple you. They, they come alongside you to encourage you in the gospel. That we, we both give and we receive in the local bodies. We partner together for the sake of the gospel. This is what Paul is describing. I want you to notice that even though Paul gives no direct commands in this slack section, Paul is still absolutely instructing the body. That he could say to them very simply in one sentence, thank you for your gift, the end. But Paul draws out this gratitude and this thing that he might instruct them, that he might help them to remember what does it look like for us to really partner together for the sake of the gospel. And so what he gives us here in this last section really is principles for gospel partnership. When we partner together in this body, and when we partner together with those missionaries and church planners that are outside of this body, what does that partnership actually look like? How do we partner together in giving and receiving for the sake of the gospel? I want you to see eight things throughout the passage. Number one, we partner together in the gospel with joy and thanksgiving. Joy should not be a surprising thing to you at this point in the book of Philippians. That nearly everything Paul does in the book, Paul does with joy. The Paul, as he enters into partnership with them, does it so with joy and with thanksgiving. That this is what this entire section is. It is expressing a gratitude and a thanks for the gift that they have sent to him. And he does so with joy. What he says in verse 10 is very similar to what he has said at the beginning of the book. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. That he's taking time at the end of the letter to say thank you to express a gratitude for their gift and really uh, not just a gratitude to them, but really a gratitude to the Lord. I rejoice in the Lord for what you've done for me. I'm so thankful for the gift that you've sent to me through Epaphroditus. I am well supplied that there is a, a joy and a thanksgiving in partnership in the gospel, that Paul is grateful not to be serving alone. He says, when I left your area, no one else entered into partnership with me, but you did. No one entered into this giving and receiving with me except for you and you alone. And he says, when I was in Thessalonica, you gave to me again and again. I have been well supplied. I have been, he says, fully paid. My, my, my bank is full because of what you have done for me. There is a joy and there is a gratitude in serving together for the sake of the gospel. The gospel partnership requires this joy and thanksgiving. That we ought to often come back again and again and again to rejoice in the Lord and to give thanks for what he does in and through his body. I don't want us to take for granted 
what God is doing and what God has done in this body. My, my pastoral leadership mantra I got from Dr. York, who I think got it from Dr. Bob Jackson. Uh, my pastoral leadership mantra is this, don't mess this up. <laughs> that was Dr. York's advice for me, don't mess it up. God has done so many wonderful things here. This is, in so many ways, a precious body, a, a place where the Lord is known and worshiped and glorified, where people are united for the sake of the gospel. There is real growth here. People are being saved. People are being discipled. There, there is, this is a beautiful body. I don't want us to miss and to fail to give thanks to the Lord, to come with joy and thanksgiving for the hope that we have in Christ. We partner together, but we do so not thinking that God has owed us or that any of this is due to any of our strategy or good works. We partner together with joy and thanksgiving. We serve together. We're happy that God has not left us alone, but that God has given us a body, that we might be together in a body, that we might serve together in this body, that when we partner together both in this body and with those that are outside of this body, we do so with joy and thanksgiving. It is an honor to stand side by side with other believers. It is an honor to pour out our lives, even as other people's, other people's lives are poured out for our sake. We do so with joy and with thanksgiving. This is what gospel partnership looks like. First, with joy and thanksgiving. Number two, we partner together in the gospel according to need and opportunity. Paul is very careful here with his things. He, he wants to make sure that he is not misunderstood. He says to them in verse 10, that I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm grateful that now at length, some of your translations may say, now finally, you have revived your concern for me. There is a way to read that and to think that Paul is chastising them and to say, well, I'm thankful that finally you thought to think of me. And I'm thankful that finally you got around to ha having some sort of concern for me. No, Paul says, no, I'm thankful that now at this time your concern has been revived. The, the image there is your concern has blossomed. It has, it has come to full bloom now. Why? Why is that? Because Paul says, not that he never had needs, but that now you have opportunity. Indeed, you were concerned for me. You, you cared for me, but now you have opportunity. That why is it that they had no opportunity before? We don't know. It could be that they had an opportunity to send to Paul, but Paul had no need. It could be that Paul had needs, but they didn't have what they needed to meet those needs. It could be that Paul had needs, and they had what they needed to meet Paul's needs, but they had no way to get it to him. So Paul says, now finally, I had a need. You had a way to meet that need, and you had a means to get it to me. You sent Epaphroditus that you had not just need and care, but you had opportunity to care for me. So Paul is essentially saying, your care of me has finally come to full bloom, to come to full blossom. It's always been there. You've always cared for me. You've always loved me, but now you had both need and opportunity. This is how we partner together according to need and, and to opportunity. You ever, you ever know somebody, when they give you gifts, they give you what they want you to have, not what you need you ever have one of those people in your life that they, they give you what they want to give, what they have available, but they don't give you what you want? Uh, some of you may remember back in, in COVID, we did the, the pastor interviews, and if you remember, Dr. York gave me a gift at the end of that interview uh, as a way, I think, to shame me and to poke fun at me. He gave me one of those shaving brushes that you use to put on shaving cream, of which I have neither need nor opportunity to use, right? I, I immediately gave it to somebody else that could, could put it to good use, Should, we partner together in the gospel according to need and opportunity. So that means then that in our gospel partnership, the first question we ask is not, what do you want to do? The first question is, what needs are there? So when we go to our missions partners, the first question with Kenny and Cheryl in Panama, the first question with Zach and Jen in Fort Collins, the first question with Buddy uh, in Durango, the first question with Daniel Barra in Birmingham or Yosef in Yash, Romania. Our first question to them is not, here's what we'd like to do, can you accommodate it? The first question is, what do you need? What is it that you need? And then, if this is your need, in what ways has God equipped us to meet that need? What opportunity do we have to come alongside to meet that need? So we, we have, this spring, as, as Overland Durango has, got, has, has begun and launched, we have sent multiple teams, uh, really over the course of the last year, to be with that team, to serve them. And you would think, well, we've sent teams, and so our teams have probably enjoyed the services, right? They've got to be in and to hear Buddy preach and to worship with them. And yet, I'll tell you, most of the people on our teams that have been out to Durango haven't been in a service. Do you know why? Because we came to Buddy and we said, we're sending you people, and what do you need? And they said, what we need more than anything is for your teams to provide childcare. 
We're not ready to do it yet. We want our people to be in the service. We want our people to hear preaching. We want our people to be able to worship. We want our people to be able to connect with the visitors and the guests who are coming and to build relationships. So what you can do for us is to help set up chairs and tables and tear down and and plug in sound systems. And then during the service, we're going to ask that you actually not be in the service, but you provide the child care so that all of our people can be in service and can learn what this looks like. You think those teams wanted to be in the service? Absolutely. But it's not about what we want. Our question is, what do you need? And then how has God put us together for the sake of the gospel that we might meet that need? Often our first question, even in the body, when it comes to trying to figure out what should I do? How should I serve the church? How should I serve in the body? Often the first question is, well, what do you want to do? That's the wrong question. We begin with what need is there? Where is there a need? And then where has God, by his grace, gifted me that I might be able to meet that need? We partner together according to need and opportunity. What is needed, and how has God put me together that I might have the opportunity to meet that need? That true concern blossoms when it is planted in the, in the soil of need and watered with a water of opportunity. He says, your concern has blossomed. It has revived for me because not only did I have need, but you had opportunity to meet that need. We're asking, what need is there? And then what opportunity has God given us to meet that need? We partner together in the gospel with joy and thanksgiving, according to need and opportunity. But Paul, again, wants to make sure that we we don't misunderstand him. That Paul is saying there is real need here, and you are meeting my need, but Paul wants to make sure that they don't think of him as needy. That he has needs, but Paul says, I'm not needy. I want to make sure that you understand what this partnership really is. And so we, we partner together, yes, according to need and opportunity. But number three, we partner together in the gospel, satisfied in Christ. Paul has this this large excursion. Probably you have not paid much attention to the rest of this passage. If you have read anything, Philippians chapter 4, it's probably been this section. Beginning in verse 11, he he wants to make sure that they, they understand that though he has needs, he is not needy. He said, I want you to know I'm not speaking of being in need. I'm I'm not desperate, I'm not needy. Why? For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul is saying, in every situation, I am satisfied in Christ. I want you to follow the flow of the argument, what Paul is saying. He says, yes, I have real needs, and you have met those needs, but I am not needy, for I have learned to be content. I know, verse 12, how to be brought low and how to abound. I've learned in every circumstance, whether that be plenty or hunger, abundance or need, how to be satisfied, how to be content. Notice here that Paul does not merely say, I have learned to be content when I have little. Paul says, I have learned to be content when I've been brought low and when I abound. We think of merely as poverty. We, we think of when we're brought low, when we're in need, when we're hungry. We think of, the, of, as, of that as the context in which we can learn to be content in Christ. Paul seems to say that abundance can be just as great a threat to our contentment in Christ as need is. Paul said, I had to learn how to trust Christ and be satisfied in him when I had nothing. And I had to learn how to trust Christ and be satisfied in him when I had more than I needed. In both poverty and abundance, when I was hungry, when I had all of my needs met, I had to learn contentment in Christ. And so Paul says, I have needs, and by God's grace, you're meeting those needs, but I am not needy, I am satisfied in Christ. For I have learned in every situation. I have learned, the language he uses there is, I have learned by experience. I have been initiated through just the trials and the circumstances of life. I have learned in every circumstance what it means to be content in Christ. And you say, well, Paul, how can you learn to be content? When you have a lot, and when you have a little, how can you be content, whatever your circumstance? This is where Paul says the verse that is probably written on your coffee cup somewhere at home. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the context. What is the all things in this context that Paul is referring to? It is living with contentment in whatever situation Paul has. That's the all things. Paul says, I have learned when I have a lot and when I have a little how to be satisfied in Jesus. Well, how, Paul? Well, because Jesus Christ himself strengthens me that I can do all things. If I have a lot, I'm fine. If I have a little, I'm fine. And if I'm somewhere in the middle, I'm fine because Jesus Christ has strengthened me that I might be able to do all things in Christ Jesus. Now, we have taken this verse often and we have ripped it out of its context and we have made it mean you can pass that math test that you didn't study for because you can do all things through Christ or you can dunk a basketball or you can, you can do all of these sort of selfish endeavors because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yet what is Paul saying? Paul says, what does that mean? That means that I can be hungry and still trust Jesus and be satisfied in him. Paul says, I can be rich and be satisfied not in my riches but in Christ. 
What is the all things? It is contentment in Christ. We partner together in the gospel, satisfied in the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of what, of our, what is on our table. We, we partner together trusting Jesus. We partner together not seeking to be satisfied by what we give or by what we receive, but in Christ and Christ alone. Sometimes we're going to have a lot to give. and Sometimes you're going to have very little to give. Sometimes you're going to receive a lot from other people, and sometimes there is going to be very little to receive. And yet, where does our satisfaction come from? Not whether we are hungry or abounding. It comes from Christ. We have learned in all things to be content in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be satisfied in Him and Him alone. When we partner together in the gospel with this sort of satisfaction, then there is only one hero in our partnership. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one hero. It's not me. And it's not you, it's not missionaries, it's not people who are taking the gospel to dark places in the field. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one hero, and it's Christ. We are satisfied in him and in him alone. Whether we have a lot to give or a little to give, or whether we have received a lot or a little, it is Christ who satisfies us. It is Christ who has cared for this body for 206 years. You look at the history of Buck Run in 206 years. Buck Run has known poverty and hunger. Buckron has known lean seasons. And in 206 years, Buckron has known abundant seasons in which it seemed that she had more than she needed. And if the Lord tarries over the next 206 years, there will be seasons of poverty. There will be seasons in which Buckron is hungry. And there will be seasons of abundance. And what we must do is learn how to be satisfied in Christ whatever season we're in. To be thankful for the work that God is doing in us to believe that whatever comes to this body, I don't know what the next 10 years holds or the next 50 years or the next 100 years holds. I don't know what seasons will be in. I don't know if we'll hunger or if we will abound, but I do know this. If we will learn to be satisfied in Christ, we can learn to be content in whatever season God has put us in. If we have a lot to give, we can be content and trust and be satisfied in Jesus. And when we have very little to give, we can be satisfied in Christ. We partner together in the gospel, satisfied not in what we give or what we receive, but satisfied in the work of Jesus and Jesus alone. Paul says we might have needs, but we are not needy. We are satisfied in Christ. If we partner together with this gospel hope that everything we need is going to come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet, number four, we partner together sharing the burden of gospel work. We share these burdens together. That Paul, again, wants to make sure that he is clear about what he said. He's just said, uh, you can sort of notice the flip-flopping. Paul says, I have needs, but he says, well, but don't think I'm needy. And then now, immediately coming out of that, he comes back and says, but I really do appreciate the way that you bore these burdens with me. Look at what he says in verse 14. Yet, in light of this, I had needs, but I'm not needy because I'm content in Christ yet. Verse 14, it was kind of you to share my troubles. The word that he uses there is the cognate of of partnership. It's the same word that he used way back in chapter 1 when he he spoke of their partnership, their sharing both of his gospel ministry and of his imprisonment. Paul says, you shared in my troubles. You were a partner with. You had fellowship in my troubles. That, That these burdens that I'm bearing, Paul says, it was kind of you to come alongside me and to bear these burdens up. This is what God, gospel partnership does. It enters us into a, a partnership with those who are like-minded that together, for the sake of the gospel, in kindness, we bear one another's burdens. That we bear the trouble. That we don't just say, I'm sorry that you're dealing with that. We, we speak about us and we. This is the, the language. If you go way back to the end of the 18th century, 1792, as William Carey was being sent out of England to go to India. William Carey was, in many ways, one of the the fathers of the modern missions movement. And as Carey sat in a small house with a group of believers who were preparing to send him to India, they understood what a dangerous thing that was. And in 1792, to travel the world, just to get there was going to bring enough danger. And so he, he said to the men that to go to India, to go to this dark place to take the gospel, was like going down a deep, dark well. And so Carey said, I commit, I will go if you will hold the rope. And so they said, we we partner with you. We commit that as long as we live, we will hold on to the rope. This is what it means to share the burden. Many of you were were here in the spring of summer of 2017. As Zach Thurman and and Jen began to gather a team and to leave this body, our first day in this building, if you remember, we announced that day something way more important than the opening of a building. We announced that Zach and Jen would be leaving to take a team to plant a church in Fort Collins. 
Many of you, if you were here in that time, many of you had uh, Zach and Jen come to your community group or your Sunday school class or, or meet with you in different groups and they held up a rope like this. How many of you have one of these? And once they said, we're gonna go into the darkness and the, where there is no proclaiming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're gonna go to the lost. We commit to go if you'll hold the rope. This is sharing the burden. This is holding up the troubles. Paul says, it was kind of you that you bore my troubles, that you, you shared in them, you had a fellowship. So that even as we send them, we send them understanding that we are holding the rope. That it's not just their joys that we share, but their burdens. It's not just their joys that we get to, to rejoice in, but it's sorrows that we share as well. We bear the burdens with them. The darkness of lostness in the world is overwhelming. But when we partner together with these missionary partners to go to dark places, it can be overwhelming. It can be lonely. It is hard to move your family across the country. And yet, when we partner together, we are making a commitment to share the burden. You, you may be un unaware, we have uh, folks in this body who who serve sort of as care teams for many of our missionary partners, in which they receive frequent updates from them that they may be aware not of only what's going on in their ministry, but they may, that they may share the burden, that they may pray specifically for Zach or for Buddy or, or for our, our other partners, Kenny and Cheryl or Romanian church planners, that we might find a way to not just hear the good things that we can celebrate, but we might know intimately what's happening in their lives, in their marriages and with their children, in their body, that we could bear the burden with them requires to do this great deal of selflessness. A concern not for ourselves, but a concern for others. We partner together for the sake of the gospel, sharing the burden. Number five, concern about producing fruit. We share the burden, even though it is harder on us, because we desire for fruit to come. Notice what Paul says. It's the way he speaks about their, their gift Again, he, he has said, no one entered into partnership with me except for you in giving and receiving. You sent to me again and again and again. And again, he clarifies in verse 17. I don't want you to think that I'm after your gifts, Paul says. I don't want you to think that I'm writing this to you just simply so that you'll send me more money or send me more resources, that I'm thankful for what you've done for me. Uh, don't, don't be mistaken about that. But Paul says in verse 17, not that I seek the gift. Paul says the thing I'm after, after all, is ultimately not your money. I'm not after the gift, but what? I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. We partner together in the, in the gospel concerned primarily about producing fruit. Notice Paul says he, he wants the fruit to be produced. That is, the fruit that will come through his preaching and teaching and through the body. Paul has in mind here, I think, not just fruit that comes from Paul's ministry, i.e., Church is being planted and people hearing the gospel and being saved. But I think Paul has in mind here the fruit that comes in the life of the Philippians through their giving. Paul has told them earlier in the gospel, or earlier in the letter, but way back in chapter 1, that I'm after that you might be filled with the fruit of righteousness. He said in verse 15 of chapter 1, I'm working for your progress and joy. He says, I, I don't really want the gift. The money is not the thing I'm concerned about. I want the fruit that is produced through your gift. Through this giving and receiving the, the fruit, the people that will come to faith, and the believers that will be strengthened. And he says, the fruit that is to your credit. It's an accounting term that Paul says, you're giving, and fruit is being produced, and this fruit is to your, your credit. That I think the image here that he has in mind is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Remember, Jesus says, don't lay up your treasures on earth, or moths destroy and thieves break in and steal. Lay up your treasures in heaven. He's saying then when you give, when you pour out yourself in this gospel partnership for the sake of the gospel, there is fruit that comes from that and you are making an internal investment. And you're concerned primarily not for the gift, but concerned for the fruit that comes from it. Paul's desire isn't for the money. Paul's desire isn't for how their gift affects him or makes him look or produces in and through him that he might have the glory. Paul's concern is that through this gift, he might produce fruit, both through his ministry and in the life of the Philippians. There is a way to partner together in the gospel, both in the local body and with partners outside of the body, that is more about appearance than it is about fruit. There is a way to partner together that is about reputation or recognition or comfort. There is a way even in the giving and receiving of the local body in, in which there can be great pride taken in how big a budget is, how many much money we have in the bank. And so that leads often to a pleading and a begging for money. Not only do you not hear us talk about money here very often, uh, one of the things you're not going to hear us do is ever plead or beg for money. 
because we don't need your money. Our Lord will give us everything that we need. There is a way to partner together in the gospel that is more about us than it is about fruit. Paul says we partner together for the sake of producing fruit. Not so that we can take in a lot of money, not so that we can give a lot of money and brag and put plaques on our walls about all the ways we've given our money. We partner together so that at the end of the day, when Jesus comes back, more people will have trusted Christ. More people will be in the kingdom. And even if nobody ever knows that it came through us, that's why we give, that we might produce fruit. Our goal is not the gift but our goal is the fruit that comes from the gift. We might make an eternal investment, that we might have fruit that is produced to our credit, that in giving and receiving, we're not after all the ways this might make us look, we're after the fruit of the gospel in and through us, that a gospel partnership is an investment, not a withdrawal. It is laying up treasures in heaven that we might have them for all eternity. Paul says, I am not after your money, but after the fruit that your gift will produce, both through me and in you. And Paul says, we partner together in the gospel as an act of worship. This is where this leads. If the giving and receiving is about producing fruit, if the giving and the receiving and the partnership and the pouring out of resources and time and energy and effort, if it is not about how we look, if it is not about our glory, if it is not about us seeming to be big and uh, wielding big budgets, it must be something else. Notice the way that Paul describes their gifts, that we partner together as an act of worship. He says, I have received your gift, I have been, again, he gives an accounting term, I have been paid in full. I have everything I need. Your gift has well supplied me what you sent with Epaphroditus. And then he describes the gift at the end of verse 18. He describes it as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. The language that Paul uses there is Old Testament language. It's an acceptable offering that is pleasing to God is an offering that is two things. It is an offering that is offered to the Lord according to the standard of God. Much of the Old Testament law is laying out exactly how the people are to bring offerings to God. And so an acceptable offering is an offering that is brought to God exactly as God requires it and is brought in a heart that desires to worship the Lord. The prophets make that clear. That God says, if you bring your offering to me, but your heart is far from me, I don't want your offering. And so that the Old Testament says an acceptable offering is one that is offered according to the standard of God with a heart of worship to the Lord. Those offerings are burned up and the prophets say that the offering, the, the smoke rises to heaven and is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. That he's pleased when his people worship him in spirit and in truth and they worship him genuinely and they pour out their lives. So Paul says, your gifts to me the way that you have supplied me, the sending of Epaphroditus, the gifts that you sent with him, the ways that you have partnered with me in giving, receiving. These gifts are not about money. They are an act of worship. They're an acceptable gift before the Lord, that it is pleasing to him. The gospel partnership must always be an act of worship. It must be about pouring out ourselves for the sake of the gospel in worship because we believe that Jesus is worthy. We believe that he's worthy of our efforts. We believe that he's worthy of all of our resources. We believe that he is worthy of our money, of our time, of our affections. We believe that Jesus is worthy of all that we have so that when we think about worship, it is not simply what we do corporately in this body on Sunday mornings from uh, 1045 to (laughs) 12-ish. Right? This is partly corporate worship, but it's not just what happens in this body. What is worship? It is everything we do for the sake of the glory of God. It is all of our lives. This is why Paul says in Romans chapter 12 to present what? Your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual act of worship. We pour out our time and our money and our energies and our efforts to the Lord as an act of worship before him that it might be a pleasing aroma. We lay out all that we have because he is worthy of it. Not too long ago, I was rebuked by a pastor, uh, not not one of ours, uh, for not in his mind, doing enough to advertise good things that Buck Run does in the community. And he pressed in on me, you need to be, you need to have things on Facebook and Twitter, you you need to be doing more to advertise the things that you do, the good things in the community. You You need to be, in some sense, sort of tooting your own horn. You need to be telling people all the good things that Buck Run does. And, and we had what was a much longer conversation than I wanted to have, and I just kept trying to press back again and again and again to say, what we do in this body is not a marketing strategy, right? It's not an advertising campaign. What we do in this body is what? It's worship. It is poured out 
as an offering to God. Not that it might be pleasing to the world, but it might be pleasing before the Father. That's why we do it. Not that we'll be well known or people will think well of us, but that we might pour out all that we have for the sake of God. We partner together as an act of worship, trusting that God and God alone is worthy of what we have. This leads us then to ask the question, well, if God is worthy of all that we have, and we pour it ourselves before the Lord for the sake of his glory, in an act of worship, if we give all that we have before God, what if we give too much? What if we give too much of our money, or too much of our resources, or too much of our time and attention and effort? What if we pour ourselves out too much? How will we be provided for? What does Paul say? Look in verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul wants them to understand, you have poured out yourself to me. You have partnered with me in giving and receiving, and it's been an act of worship, and he says to them, don't worry about giving too much. Don't worry about pouring too much out before the Lord, because why? Because God will do everything to make sure you can keep giving, that we partner together, not just in, in this giving and receiving with sharing the burdens and producing fruit and as an act of worship, but we do this together in faith trusting that as we pour ourselves out, that God in mercy and in grace will fill us back up. That we might pour ourselves out again. That God might fill us back up. This is the Christian life. Being filled by the Lord, that we might pour ourselves out. Notice the way that Paul lays it out. Look, look at his argument. I, he says in verse 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul says, how will you be supplied? It'll be out of the riches of God. Why do we not beg for money? Because the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to our God. Everything is his. And we trust that he will give us what we need. That we belong to him. He is lavishly rich in every way. He is a God of great riches. And so we trust that God will give us whatever we need. And he says he, is, he will supply us according to his riches in glory. Not only is he rich, but he dwells in glory. And how does this gloriously rich, lavish God, how does he pour out his wealth upon us? In Christ Jesus. If God were to give us nothing else from now until he brought us home, what he has given us and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus would be enough. Amen. If he were to give us nothing else, that what we have, the hope and the gospel, the grace and the mercy that is ours in Christ is more than enough to sustain us. He has supplied every one of our needs richly in Christ Jesus. And yet, what's more than that, he gives us more. He uses us. He fills us up that we might pour ourselves out for his sake. This is what Paul means, that he is supplying us. Notice the word there. He supplies us according to his riches, not out of his riches. One, one commentator says about that, that, think about it this way. If I had a million dollars and I gave you a check for a thousand dollars, which I do not have and I am not giving you. Uh, <laughs> But if I did, and I had a million dollars, and I gave you a check for a thousand dollars, then I have given you out of my riches. But if I have an unlimited bank account, then I could give you a blank check, and I have gifted you, supplied you according to my riches, not out of them. Because at the end, every need you had would be fulfilled, and on the back end, my coffers would, would not be diminished one bit. This is what it means that God gives us, supplies us out of his riches. That God can give us everything we need in Christ Jesus from now into eternity, and it diminishes his riches not one bit. That his coffers never run empty. That God always has more to give. Well, this is good news if we're partnering together for the sake of the gospel. We can keep giving and keep giving and keep giving, and God will keep filling us up. Why? Because he will never run out. Coffers are never diminished. God always has exactly what we need. This is the promise that Paul is saying, that God will not fail us. This is not Paul promising, by the way, that life won't be hard. This is not Paul promising that every single physical want or desire that we have will ever be met. Uh, Paul has just said, I know what it is to be hungry. Paul knows what it, what it is to be shipwrecked and to be beaten and to be in jail and to face imprisonment. It doesn't mean that life will be easy, but Paul says that in this I have learned that whether I am hungry or I am abounding, that I am satisfied in Christ, that every real need I have is met for me in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we partner together in faith, in faith that God will supply our needs. A partnership that is based on the strength and the strategy of the partners is doomed to fail. If we partner together in this body, because we think that together we can do this. 
We think that together, we can know how to spend our money and we can develop strategies without the Holy Spirit to reach people for the gospel or to disciple people or to teach. If we think that our partnership together in this body is about us on either side, then it is a partnership that is doomed to fail. A partnership is based in faith that God will supply all our needs. That all we have to do is to pour ourselves out and it is God who will fill us back up. It is a partnership in faith, trusting that God himself will supply us. When we sent Zach in the summer of 2017, Zach spent nearly a year spending time in recruiting our best and brightest, and Zach took a lot of faithful servants from Buck Run. He went with some 20-something people, and to be honest, in the years since 2017, more people have begun to move out to Fort Collins to plant Overland. It hurt us in the short term to lose Zach and Buddy and to lose that team of people that were faithful servants here. It hurt us to lose them. We lost something in pouring them out for the sake of the lost in Fort Collins. If you talk to Zach, what they're going through right now, as they have now done the exact same thing we did, is they have sent Buddy and Brooke and a whole team of people from their new church plant, they've sent out to plant another church. Do you think it hurts them to lose some of their most faithful servants in the body? Oh, it hurts. It's hard. Why do we pour ourselves out this way? It is only if we have faith that God himself will supply every need. So we pour ourselves out this way, trusting that God will do something with it, that he will produce the fruit. I shared this with you on the week after Easter. We had nearly 1,000 people here on Easter. And yet in Fort Collins and in Durango, they had together nearly 700 people who gathered early on Easter morning to worship and to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zach today, in a couple hours, will baptize nine new believers These are bodies that did not exist six years ago, that did not exist six six months ago, but are now in existence with people hearing the gospel every week, believing and being saved. Why? Because we poured ourselves out for the sake of God, trusting that God will supply every need we have in Christ Jesus. This is what gospel partnership looks like. We do it in faith, trusting that God and God alone is enough. And when we pour ourselves out this way, trusting that God and God alone is enough, that it's his strength that makes the partnership produce fruit, then we partner together in this gospel for the glory of God. That we don't, at the end, get to pat ourselves on the back and to say, look what we did. We don't get to say, look look at all the wonderful things that we have done. Look at all the ways that we have spent our money and spent our time and poured out our people for the sake of the gospel. That at the end of the day, the fact that there were 700 people worshiping the Lord on Easter Sunday, the fact that nine people will be baptized today in Fort Collins, we don't get to pat ourselves on the back for that. Who gets the glory for that? It is the Lord. It's, we can do all things through him. It is his riches that supplies us. God and God alone is glorified in our gospel partnership. Paul says, I want you to, to remember. I'm thankful for what you've done. I'm thankful for the gifts you've sent. I'm thankful for the way that you've partnered with me in giving and receiving, for sending Epaphroditus, for sending supplies. When I was in Thessalonica, you supplied me again and again. I have everything I need. I am paid in full. I, have, I am well supplied before the Lord. And Paul says, but I want you to know that it is God who gets the glory. Notice what he says. To, God, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That no one gets to stand before the throne of God and to beat their chest and to say, look what I did. No one gets to stand before Jesus and to ask for credit for the things that God himself has done in and through us. Paul says, I'm thankful to partner with you. I'm eager to stand side by side with you to, to continue to work for your progress and joy for the sake of the gospel to the nations that more people might hear. But Paul says, it's not about my glory or your glory. That God alone gets the glory to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. What is Paul doing? He's doing the same thing he did at the very beginning of the gospel. He's holding up the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did we say week one? What is the banner that stands over the the church? Both the church at Philippi and the church at Buckron. What is the banner that ought to be over our life? The glory of God supreme in all things. In all that Paul has said throughout the letter, he comes back to this idea. The glory of God supreme in all things. When we Work together for the sake of the gospel that more people may hear and believe and be saved. Paul says, it is God and God alone who gets the glory. Notice what Paul does in these final greetings. He says, you might miss it. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. Say, say hi to all the believers. 
The brothers who are with me, they greet you. Those that are serving with me and maybe even imprisoned with me, they greet you. In verse 22, all the saints greet you. And then notice this phrase that he sticks in there. All the saints greet you, what? Especially those of Caesar's household. I can't help but wonder if Paul says this with a smart, if he's smiling as he writes this. Who's he referencing here? All of those in Caesar's household. He's referencing the believers that now have heard the gospel and believed and been saved because Paul is imprisoned in Caesar's household. Paul's in Rome. Remember, he's strapped to a guard. The Paul had said back in chapter one, I'm in prison, and yet though they think this is bad for the sake of the gospel, I'm in prison, and I'm telling everybody about Jesus, right? That the gospel of Jesus Christ is going throughout all the praetorian guard, that Caesar thinks that he has me imprisoned, and he has stopped the gospel, but Paul ends the letter by saying, all the believers greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. It is a reminder that where the gospel goes forth, the glory of God goes with it. But Paul is reminding them, even at the end of the letter, don't give up. God is at work. I might be imprisoned. I might not know whether I'm going to live or die. I might lose my head soon, but you need to know God is still at work through the gospel for his glory. Let all the saints say hi to you, especially the ones of Caesar's household. It is a reminder that everything we do in partnering for the sake of the gospel is for the glory of God, and God is gracious to see fit that he brings fruit. Where the gospel goes, the glory of God goes with it. And so Paul is saying throughout the letter, Press on. Run towards the goal that you might win the prize. With the banner above your life, it's the glory of Christ supreme in all things. Living in every moment and light of the gospel. Live as citizens worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and do it together and continue in it until Jesus Christ comes back. That through you, the gospel might go forth. That more may hear and believe and be saved not for your glory or for mine, but for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it should not surprise us that Paul reminds us that in and all, as we press on, as we stand firm, as we lock arms side by side, as we run towards the finish line that we might win the prize, in it all, in everything, we are held by the grace of God. Paul ends the letter this way. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Live as citizens of the gospel, worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the grace of Christ will hold you.